I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. If you come to Evensong in Lent, you're likely to hear some pretty grim bits of the Minor Prophets. Readings about wrath, judgment, punishment, and rejection. The verse from the Ten Commandments that I've just quoted sounds equally threatening, equally difficult to hear, equally unfair. If you ask the average person about the Ten Commandments, they're likely to say they are broadly a good thing a moral standard which can be extracted from their context in faith and used as the basis for secular law. But not so much this bit. And on one level, we are right to read this and think, but it isn't fair. Retribution for our, our I'll start again. Retribution for our own iniquities, fair enough. Although secretly we might think that retribution on other people for their own iniquities is even better. But retribution falling on the children for the sins of the parents, that's not fair. And the second half of the verse, with God's steadfast love remaining for a thousand generations, doesn't really make it any better. When I was a child, I was really irritated by my mum's stop response to my complaint that it isn't fair. She would say, well, life isn't. And I have really tried not to annoy my own children by saying that, but sometimes it's true. I know it's not fair, but life really isn't fair. And we often behave as if we're children and God is the parent. It's a relationship structure that our liturgy invites us into, and in many ways it's really helpful, but sometimes it means we get stuck in a place where we are whining like children, but it's not fair. That's why readings like this can be so difficult. If we have an image of God as the perfect parent, who, unlike our own parents, makes everything fair and just and straightforward, this kind of reading attacks that image. If God is not fair, does that mean that God is not our good father? If God is not fair, does that mean that God is not good at all? In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul tells the church in Corinth that God is infinitely beyond what they can comprehend, to the extent that it might not map onto their understanding at all. When Paul says God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength, Perhaps we might also add God's unfairness is fairer than human fairness. By which I don't just mean that when God is as unfair as God gets, God is still fairer than humans are. I mean that when humans look at God and see unfairness, what we're actually seeing is a fairness beyond our understanding. A translation of the Ten Commandments that we heard from the NRSV says that God is jealous and that God punishes. But that's not the only way to understand the text. We could also say that God is passionate or impassioned and that God does not stand in the way of the consequences of sin, something that the story of the fall, which we heard much earlier in Lent, has already made clear. God is passionate and impassioned. And since our knowledge of what God is like is given to us primarily in Jesus, we should expect to see Jesus too being impassioned and angered by sin, just as we do in the gospel story of the cleansing of the temple. Jesus is impassioned, filled with anger, not anger that is, cap not anger that is capricious or unfair or punitive, but anger that is righteous burning rage that sees sin, exploitation, corruption, and boils over, to mix my metaphors, into action. Action that is against sin, that puts an end to exploitative behavior, 
action that might well have been experienced by the money changers and animal dealers as punitive, but in intention is not so much punishment as a consequence of their sin. Now that is clearly fair in the sense that it's a very direct consequence applied to those who have directly done harm. We haven't yet addressed the unfairness of the verse from the Ten Commandments, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents. But this too is consequence rather than punishment. It's not that God is choosing to punish vindictively, it's that God who gave us free will refuses to infantilize each one of us and the human race by protecting each one of us or the human race from the consequences of our actions. The actions of our ancestors shape our own lives. We can see that in climate crisis, in the continuing reverberations in this city and in this country of colonialism and the slave trade, in the legacy in the institutions we're part of from previous generations in their arguments and preoccupations and prejudices. We live in a world that's fallen, that's shaped by sin, that bears sometimes little resemblance to the world that God created good. And God has not protected the human race from the consequences of its actions. God has not protected us from the consequences of our ancestors' decisions. This is not retribution or punishment, this is adulthood. But to return to our first question, is it fair? Not by human standards, which expect the slate to be wiped clean for us, but God does not work by human standards. This is as bleak as the minor prophets who are so difficult to hear at Evensong. And Lent can be bleak. It begins with mortality, the consequence of the first ever sin, and reminds us that our world is fallen and that we are caught up in systems and structures of sin in which sometimes, perhaps often, there is no good decision available to us. But God is passionate. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. God's unfairness is fairer than human fairness. And Lent also begins with Jesus in the wilderness, resisting temptation, setting his intention for his ministry to come. God, who will not infantilize human beings by artificially protecting us from the consequences of our sin, will nevertheless redeem us and bring us to a new heaven and a new earth. A redemption that we cannot deserve, that is completely unfair in the unfairness of God, which is fairer than human fairness. <clears throat> in his ministry, we see Jesus giving us a glimpse of that new heaven and that new earth in miracles which erase the consequences of that fallen world briefly for individuals, in teaching and actions and anger which demonstrate God's passion for human beings and against sinful structures and systems and behaviors. In the temple, Jesus sees a structure of sin, all the worse for being overlaid on the place that should be a glimpse of the new heaven, a structure that takes God's good commands and twists them into weapons for exploitation and corruption. His anger burns not simply against the misuse of a holy place, but against the traders who see God's commands as nothing but the opportunity to become rich, caring nothing for the people who are collateral damage along the way. This is, of course, a message of hope, but it's also a message of judgment. We are the traders as well as the collateral damage. All of us are part of the sinful world, caught up in structures of sin. All of us are, in the language of the Ten Commandments, part of the lineage of the unfaithful, suffering the consequences of the sins of our parents. And yet all of us too are part of the lineage of the faithful, receiving the love of God that is the consequence of the faithfulness of a thousand generations of ancestors. Lent is a chance to recognize how far we are caught up and complicit 
in systems and structures of sin, but that bigger and more powerful even than these systems and structures of sin, God is present. God reminds us that although the effects of sin are felt for generations, there is also mercy, there is also love, which are even greater. And in Holy Week and on Good Friday, we will see the terrible places where these sinful structures lead, cowardice and betrayal, condemnation and death. But then at last on Easter Day, the moment where God's love, shown to the thousandth generation of the faithful, flowers into victory over sin and death. And as in Lent we travel there, we are called to be honest about sin, about our own sin and about the sin that is so pervasive that we don't see it, about the ways in which our lives are unjust and our privilege unearned. Even in this fallen world, where no decision can undo the effects of sin, we are called to try, to live justly as far as we are able, to use our privilege and our anger to make just a little bit of the world just a little bit fairer and to keep from despair, knowing that all this is and will be redeemed in Jesus our Lord. Amen.